Today is the 50th anniversary of the Attica prison uprising, uh, the Attica prison massacre, the Attica prison rebellion, the, sometimes it's referred to as the Attica prison riot. Um, this was, this was a, a, a very big deal when it happened, and it's a very big deal in history. It is the bloodiest prison riot in the history of the United States. On this day, on September 9, 1971, out of the 2,200 men who were locked up at Attica, uh, 1,281 of them rose up and said, no more. They had a list of, uh, of demands. They took 42 staff hostage. They basically took over the prison. Uh, the authorities, there was four days of negotiations between the people in the, uh, between the prisoners and the, the officials and the, and the state, the governor got involved, the whole thing. And uh, the authorities agreed to 28 of their demands. I mean, there, there were some very, very legitimate uh, complaints that they had. And uh, then Nelson Rockefeller, the governor, the then you know, governor of New York, ordered the state, you know, basically said, take back the prison. And they found 43 people dead when they took back the prison. And the story that we all heard back in 71 was that the dead people had been killed by the prisoners. And it was, uh, there, there were 10 correctional officers who died and 33 inmates. 43 people altogether. What we later learned was that all of the prisoners who died and apparently some of the correctional officers who died were killed by the officers themselves. And the reason I, I bring this up outside of the historical context, out of the, you know, on this day in history, you know, 50 years ago this happened, um, is this piece uh, in, that ran in, in Time Magazine yesterday by Heather Ann Thompson, titled 50 Years After Attica, Prisoners Are Still Protesting Brutal Conditions. Will America Finally Listen? And she notes, uh, she, she opens the piece by saying it happened in January. Now we're talking 2021. It happened in January inside California's Santa Clara County jails. In April of last year, it happened at the Westville Correctional Facility in Indiana. It happened two separate times this year alone at the St. Louis City Justice Center. American prisoners basically, well, she uses the word erupted. I think you could call it uh, rebellion. And, uh, and in fact, she, she quotes uh, one of the people who was in, in this prison in Missouri telling a journalist, rebellion is our only grievance system. So, I mean, how else, how else do prisoners make their cases known? Now, most of the prison riots and jail rebellions that are happening, that have happened over the last year and a half, have been not so much over the brutality that's being inflicted on people routinely which was at the basis of Attica, you know, a prison guard culture of violence and sadism. Um, but uh, around COVID, that's what's, you know, the, the fact that uh, the prisons are not dealing with COVID well and uh, the prisoners are mad as hell and not gonna take it anymore. But the frame that I wanted to drop this into, and, and then I'll uh, end my rant and pick up your phone calls here, but um, the frame I wanted to put this in is the correction system as a, as a whole. I think we have to acknowledge that there are some people, for whatever reason, who are so damaged that they do have to be separated from society, in some cases, for their entire lives. I mean, we just have to acknowledge that. On the other end of the spectrum, there are some people who have broken laws and committed crimes who are genuinely remorseful and want to repay their debt to society and want to reintegrate themselves into society in a more you know, appropriate and wholesome way after having repaid their debt to society. And we conflate these or we, we, we mix these two together in ways that turn people who are not career criminals into career criminals that do extraordinary psychological damage to a lot of people who probably shouldn't be, in, you know, this should not 
this, this kind of punishment should not be inflicted upon them. And we hurt ourselves as a society in the process. I have uh, said many times in this program and many times over the years that I think probably the most important documentary, maybe the most important documentary I've seen in my life, is Michael Moore's Where to Invade Next, where he goes around the world and looks at different countries and how they're dealing with things from health care to uh, fam paid family leave. To prisons and he and he goes to Norway and he looks at the prison system in Norway and it's a it's a literally a whole completely different thing it's it's uh, focused on rehabilitation and we have a prison prison system that is focused on punishment now I'm not saying that punishment shouldn't be part of this but just being incarcerated is massive punishment having your liberty taken away is incredibly traumatizing but then to be brutalized on top of that, that moves us out of corrections and, and uh, punishment and into uh, you know, a realm that I think you can only describe as torture. And frankly, I, I believe that this came out of, and I think there's fairly good evidence for it, and we've had people on this program, you know, Maya Shenwar in particular, uh, multiple times, talking about this, that, that this came out of our experience with slavery as a nation, our, our enslaving other human beings and the methods that uh, as a nation, that, and I say we, I, obviously I'm talking about white people in this country, um, used to enforce the brutality of slavery. And it is still with us. And it is still very much a part of, our, of, our, of the culture of imprisonment. And it's embodied by people like Donald Trump uh, telling a, a, a convention of police chiefs, you know, when you put that guy in the car, the, the suspect, a person who has not been convicted of any kind of crime, put that guy in the car, rough him up a little, right? Don't, don't put your hand over his head so he doesn't bang his head on the door, just, you know, slam him in there. I, obviously, I'm paraphrasing, but you, you, you recall the incident. And it's a mentality that is particularly directed toward people of color. There's a new viral video uh, going on, a new video that's going viral right now out of Chicago of a woman who was walking through a park and a police, uh, she's black, a white police officer came up and said, you got to leave the park. She's like, okay, she's heading for the exit. She walks past four white people. The cop has not said a word to any of them, but he's following her with a gun. And somebody caught it on video, and she thought she was going to be killed. He went nuts on her. And he's now on administrative leave, which means he's still getting his paycheck and doesn't have to work. And it's like this, there is this punitive, violent culture in this country that, as I said, I think echoes back to slavery. And we have to figure out a way to 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 pull this weed out by its roots. And a lot of it is based in racism, obviously, but a lot of it is also based in, 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 in our culture, in the way we raise our kids, in the way that we, that we, uh, that we entertain ourselves with our movies, you know, the, the whole kind of Bruce Willis mentality, not to pick on Bruce Willis, he's a great actor, um, but you, you get what I'm saying. You know, the, the, the vigilante justice kind of thing, the, the, the mythology of the Wild West and, and, and all that. And I'll just wrap this up by saying, you know, Attica is still with us. And our prisons are still brutal places, far more brutal than the prisons in Europe, for example. And if we don't start looking at ways to reform the way that we're treating essentially ourselves, we're going to continue to have these kinds of a kinds of crisis in the United States that are frankly not healthy for us as a society not to mention the the brutality that is routinely just gratuitously inflicted on people who have committed crimes but in most cases not crimes deserving of that kind of brutality